In this video we're going to talk about inversion symmetry and how we use the labels G and U to denote the symmetry of orbitals and identify them. So we have uh, our internuclear axis here. We have some homonuclear diatomic. Homonuclear meaning that, meaning that both nuclei have the same uh, atomic charge, thus they are the same element. For example, hydrogen and hydrogen, carbon and carbon, neon and neon, etc. So we have this here, and our entire molecule here has a symmetry element called an inversion center. So halfway between each of the nuclei here, there's a point here where our Hamiltonian is symmetric with respect to inversion about this center. So what does inversion mean? The symmetry operation inversion, if we have an inversion operator here that we define acting on a point x, y, z, so we have P axon X, Y, Z, and the result is minus X minus Y minus C. So it takes, let's say, for example, some point X, Y, Z over here. If I invert it, I get minus X minus Y minus Z, which is over here, and then on the opposite side of the screen. And then any point along the internuclear axis here just gets reflected to the other side because X and Y are zero, and Z is some positive or negative value on the Z axis here. Okay, so that's inversion, and because our Hamiltonian is symmetric with respect to inversion, that means the Hamiltonian and this inversion operator commute. Their commutator is zero, and just like in the previous video uh, where we looked at that for the uh, angular momentum component along the z-axis, whenever things two operators commute, they have a common set of eigenfunctions. So this means whenever our uh, p operator acts on our wave function, say psi, let's say of the ith state, that means that you get some eigenvalue c back times the wave function. That's, that means it has to be an eigenfunction of p because our, weight, our orbitals are an eigenfunction of h. Okay, so that's all fine. So that means that they're also an eigenfunction of p squared because if you're, an eigenfunction, if you're an eigenfunction of an operator, you're also an eigenfunction of the operator squared. So p squared acting on psi just gives us c squared, this eigenvalue squared times psi. All right, that's all good. But if we act inversion on something twice, if we invert something, we get minus x minus y minus z. We just invert all the coordinates. But then if we invert it again, we get back to x, y, z. If I invert if the inverse, then I just get back to the original. So inversion squared is equivalent to the identity operator. P squared is equivalent to getting the same point back. It's an identity operation. It leaves the point unchanged. Or in our case, it leaves our wave function unchanged. So since P squared is equal to an identity operator, that means that an identity operator acting on psi gives us 1 times psi back. So that means we have this equivalence here and that c squared has to equal 1. And because c squared equals 1, that means c equals plus or minus 1. So for every orbital we have, we're going to have an eigenvalue for this inversion operation of either plus 1 or minus 1. That means for every orbital, we're going to have it either be antisymmetric or symmetric with respect to this inversion center. And this is going to give us a labeling system that you're going to hear a lot for molecular orbitals, and this is the place where it comes from. So if you have C equals 1, then that is going to be symmetric with respect to inversion. And if an orbital is symmetric with respect to inversion, we call that orbital G, which stands for Gerada or Gerada. I don't know. I'm not... Uh, German, so ask Germans how to pronounce that German word. If c equals minus 1, then your orbital is going to be antisymmetric with respect to inversion. To inversion. And antisymmetric is sh signaled by a shorthand u, which means, if I am not drawing a terrible u there, u, which means undurata, or undurata, I don't know. Again, don't quote me on pronunciations. Okay, so we have G for symmetric, U for antisymmetric. So let's look at some examples here on the right and see what type of orbitals we get. If we have two S orbitals, uh, 1S and 1S, overlapping here, they'll overlap to form an orbital that has just one phase. 
and it's going to be all positive like this. If I pick a point here and I go to its inverse, minus x, minus y, minus z, same sign, positive, 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 positive. Any point, if I go to its inversion, is still positive. So that means that this orbital is garata, g. And according to our definitions from the previous video, you should be able to convince yourself that this is a sigma orbital. So this would be called a sigma g orbital. If you have two s orbitals that combine out of phase, you would get an orbital that looks like this, where you have, let's say, positive on the left, negative on the right. Now what happens if we invert? This point inverses here. I went from positive to minus. Uh, this point's inverse is over here, minus to plus. This point's inverse is here, plus to minus. I'm switching sign every time. So this again is a sigma orbital, and it is undurata sigma u. If we have two p's overlap constructively, like a px and a py from the previous video, the net result is going to be a pi orbital, forming a pi bonding orbital here. Positive on this side, negative on this side. Inverse of this point is this point, plus, plus to minus, plus to minus, plus to minus. So this is a pi orbital, and it is undurata. So notice here the bonding orbital for sigma is gerata. Bonding orbital for pi is undurata. So sig g and u don't indicate whether something is bonding or anti-bonding. They just indicate its, its symmetry with respect to inversion. If I have two p orbitals that overlap in the opposite sense, that is destructively, I have a situation where I have plus minus and then minus plus. Okay, inversion of this point, positive to positive, positive to positive, zero to zero, uh, positive to positive, negative to negative, etc. Each time I'm keeping the same sign. So this is a pi g, so an antibonding orbital, nodal plane between the two nuclei there. The antibonding orbital is a pi g, a gerata orbital. Okay, then one last example. If we have two uh, pz orbitals overlapping on their sides there, if they overlap constructively, we get something that looks like this. It will be positive in the middle here, negative on the outsides. And if they overlap deconstructively or destructively, we'll get, for example, positive, negative, negative, positive. Then this, in each case, is going to be a sigma orbital, based off of our descriptions from the previous video. If I go from the inversion of this point here to here is positive to positive, positive to positive, po ne or positive, positive, negative, negative. I'm keeping the same sign, sigma g. Again, a sigma bonding orbital is gerata. Inversions here, negative to positive, negative to positive positive to negative, sigma undurata, I'm switching signs. So these are some examples. Uh, these are going to be the types of labels we use to define different atomic orbitals. We're going to define them both by their angular momentum, sigma, pi, delta, etc., and by their symmetry with respect to inversion uh, by gerata or undurata.